worship the Lord for one more moment right now. Hallelujah.
when he created woman, he took a, a tenderness, a care, and, and took the, the rib from Adam to create a woman. He, he took time and meticulous care to create us each and every one. So when you feel that you are not worthy or you feel that you are unable to do something, I'm here to tell you that God created you with a very specific purpose in mind. The very creator of the universe created you for a reason. He created everything in existence, but He took a specific, meticulous time and moment to make you and put you into a specific place. So, don't be overwhelmed by everything else going on and understand that God, a loving Father, a caring Father, cares about each and every one of us. Right. That He cares about what you're dealing with on a daily basis. He cares about your concerns. He cares about your worries. He cares about you. I wouldn't know anything else to care as much, or I wouldn't know anyone else to care as much as like in Matthew 10, 29 and 31. And it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? No. All right. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are more of more value than many sparrows. If he takes that much care in knowing about a sparrow, and how much more worthy are we than a sparrow, he cares about everything that he has made. Yeah. He cares about every little detail. He cares about every minute little tiny thing that may seem, seem big or small to us, but He cares because you care. He cares about the things that we care about. But sometimes we allow ourselves to be so overwhelmed by everything that is going on around us that we lose sight of the, an understanding of what God really does care about. He, does, he doesn't care about me because He's letting me go through this. No, you don't understand. He's letting you go through this because He wants you to be stronger right. for something later. Yeah. Because He's called you for a specific purpose. Things may seem overwhelming right now, but, but you don't know what's coming down the road. And He sees it and He says, look, I need you to get stronger right here. I need you to get stronger right now. Because later on, I've got something better and something bigger and something that's going to affect more people than just you later on. I want you to understand that I do care about you and I want you to get better. I want you to get stronger. I want to heal your wounds. I want, I want you to understand that I care about your situation right now. But there's something even bigger coming later on that I want you to be prepared for because you don't need to be fretting about that one later. I want you to get through this right now. I want you to come on just one more step. Yeah. Just one more step. I'm right behind you. You know, he's right behind us. He's got he's got his hand on us. He's pushing us forward. He says, come on, you got just a little bit further. Just a little bit longer. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Come on, just a little bit more. Yeah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. When you're getting, when you're first learning to ride a bike. You know, you're you're right behind, right behind him. I remember, I remember, I remember. You know, it's kind of my, my dad running alongside me. Come on, you got this, you got this, you got this. And then he, and then he took his hands off of me, but he was, he was right there next to me. He was right there next to me, holding on. He 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 didn't have his hands on me, but he had his hands around me, ready to catch me when he needed to. And he was right there. If I fell over, that all he had to do was swoop, swoop in, and pick me up. How much more does our God care than even that? that? That He's right there with us and He's got His hands around us and He's saying, all right, just a little bit further and I've got you. Don't worry about it. Come on, you got this. And maybe we do fall. Maybe we scuff up our knee. Maybe, maybe we bump an elbow. Maybe, maybe we end up with a busted lip. I don't know. But He's right there to swoop us up and say, come on, you can get back on there and you can do this. This is something that I have for you. Right. 
as I come to a close of this part right now, I just want to say I'm so thankful for a godly father. Amen. But how much more am I thankful for a God who is my father? Yes, amen. Who cares about everything that is going on? Amen, amen, amen. That no matter if you have a father or not, you do have one. And he's bigger than any anything that can come my way. So, on Father's Day, I want to say Happy Father's Day. I don't want to say Happy Father's Day to the greatest father of them all. I want to say Happy Father's Day to God because I'm so thankful that He cares. Yes, can God. we just can we just worship the Lord for Bless one moment Lord. right now, Lord? Thank you, God. You are worthy. We worship you, Lord. We're thankful for you being there with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God, praise God. It's also, I've only been in the Father's game for a couple of years now, and I still don't think I got the handle of it. But, as I was thinking of of my dad, that he not he might have not took us to church, but he did teach us. He taught me, Brad, and Eric, all three of us, how to work with our hands. He taught us the joy it is when you can provide for a family. My dad might have not known everything that he needed to know, but he did teach us how to work, how to provide for a family. And then my father-in-law, he taught me how to understand God, how to pray. And when you can put praying and working hands into God's ministry, God's mission, God's understanding, you can make wonders happen. Right. As we've already stood and, and prayed, I'm just going to go ahead and just open up a scripture and then we'll just go forward. But if we can all turn to Psalms 103 and 13. It says, like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. In other, ver in other versions, it says that the Lord has compassion. And I was talking to Bethany, I said, pity, is, I know that it's the same meaning, but pity, just, it seems, now it's, it seems like it's a bad word, but the Lord has compassion on us, so as a compassionate father. As we think about how we, how we deal and raise our kids, we have to have compassion on them. Right. But at the same time, I can't. we have to treat them differently. We have to raise them differently. I can't raise Jonah how I raise Joshua. I can't raise Joshua how I raise Jackson. That is the same as the Lord is with us. The Lord has to, has to deal with us differently. Why does He do that? Because He is trying to raise a different prophet. Right. He's trying to raise somebody that can... That can they can talk to other people, other families differently. We have to go about things differently. But as I think about the compassionate father, I think of of the of the of the dad and the two sons is when they were and they soon they knew as soon as their dad died they were going to get their inheritance. But the one son wanted his now. He wanted it now. He didn't want to wait. He wanted it now. But sometimes, and then we look at it and go, well, he should have just waited. How many times do we do that with God? How many times when we want something now and we don't get it, so we just keep begging and begging and begging? Same as I can't throw my keys to Joshua right now and go, hey, take me to Walmart. We know what's going to happen. We're not going to make it far. If Jonah got in the car, we'd probably go somewhere with our animals. We might have to walk a little bit because he probably ditched the car. But we knew what's going to happen. The dad knew if he gave the, the son the inheritance, he knew what was going to happen. Right. But also with God, if we keep begging God, I want that brand new car, God. I want it and I want it now. Right. God is telling us to wait. But we want to keep bugging God. I really want this car. Same as when you tell your kid, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And every two seconds you look up, he has his hand by the stove. We know what's going to happen. When he touches it, it's going to burn him. So what do we do when, God, when we keep bugging God that we want that brand new car? 
He'll give it to us. And then we're not going to be excited when that first bill comes in. Or that insurance bill comes in. But so the, the father went ahead and gave him the money, gave him the inheritance. And it didn't take him too long to spend all of it. Right. And then he realized that he had it much better in his father's house. Yeah. So he came back. And he just, he knew that the servants had it better. And he didn't, all he wanted to do was just be there. Right. But as soon as the dad saw him, he had compassion for him. Yes. He was coming back home. Yes. How do you think God feels when somebody that is backslidden comes back to Him? God's not going to be like, well, I told you so that you'd be back. I told you that this is what is going to happen. God will wrap Him up in His arms like nothing's happened because you are back home with God. When this dad saw him, he had compassion. As you think about these kids that run away, and I know we said, I've said it before, if one of the boys ran away and he came back, I would tear him up. <laughs> I, would, I would ground him for months. But as you hear about all these kids getting kidnapped or they're every day on Facebook, some child is missing. If that was your child, and he came back home, all that anger, all that upsetness would go away. Right. This dad was worried about his son. When he gave him the money, you know he had to be worried about him. When your kids go out, when they go anywhere, where they go and you can't, and you can't hold them, you get worried, but as soon as you see their face, all that anger and all that sadness goes away. But he had compassion on his son. But as the, for the other son, the other son was upset. Yes. That said, I didn't go nowhere, Dad. I stayed right here with you. Right. Why does he get all of this? The dad understood why the son was upset. Don't tell you. You can, you can say, well, I don't want to go. Yeah, you'd be upset too if your brother or sister ran away and they came back and they got all their stuff. You'd be like, I've been here the whole time. If Brad Eric got something that I didn't get, I'd be good. I'd be upset too. But the but the dad understood and, and said, "You didn't lose nothing. Right. You stayed here. Why do we should we be should we be excited when somebody comes back to the Lord? Yes, should we get should we get excited when somebody is backslidden and says they will never set foot in the church again, walks through that door, falls on their face, and repents?" Should we be excited? Yes. Or should we, as soon as church is over, we, we, we'll just say, well, we told you that was going to happen. We told you if you left. How do we feel? What do you think if God did that to us? When we fell short of the glory of God, we've all made bad decisions. Once in our life, we have made just bad decisions that our family was going to tell us not to do that. But we are going to do it anyways. If God, if we have compassion on our children, the Lord has compassion on them that fear Him. Yes, I cannot raise Joshua the same as I can raise Jonah. I can't raise Jonah the same as I would raise Joshua. But I can raise them in God's ways. Yes. I can raise all three of them in how I, can, how I show them that God is the only way. Yes. God is the only answer. God will answer their prayers if they stand fast with God. So on this Father's Day, we thank the Father yes. that sacrificed His life because when they were crucifying Jesus, He, made the, he said the thing, Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. Yes. We think we know the right answer. But sometimes we make bad decisions. But if we repent and come back to the glory of God, God will have compassion on us. When we were baptized, repented and baptized in Jesus' name, He put a new He put a new cloak, He put a new robe on us. He put us in new clothing, put us in new armor for the glory of God. 
as today as we are thankful for our fathers. We are thankful for God. We are thankful for men, for men that stands up for God. Yes. <coughs> and we're thankful that He does have compassion on us. Praise the Lord. I'm really thankful for the Word of God and, and the young men that spoke about, about fathers. And, and as I was trying to just put down some points today, I was thinking about the prodigal son and also what Jesus said about the sparrow and how much of Heavenly Father. And I decided to go just in a little bit different direction. And I know there's no... Uh, there's a lot of help books, you know, how to be a good father, and you know, and each book is different, tells you different things. I remember hearing a story about a man that said that he was going to write a book on how to be a parent. And somebody asked him, well, are you a parent now? And he says, no. He goes, uh, he goes, well, my wife is expecting. He says, well, don't write that book for at least another 20 years. <laughs> it's, you know, he thought he had all the answers when he, so later, the older minister asked the young one, he says, so how's that book coming? He goes, I had to change everything. Because every child is different and every situation is different. But there are five things that I believe that a father should be. And the first one that the Lord showed me is that we are to be protectors. A father should be a protector. In other words, that he should not be coming home with all his problems. They should not come home whining and crying about the things that went wrong in the day. Uh, he should try his best, you know, not to show that anything is bothering him when it comes to his children. A home should be a happy place, a place that a refuge for the children to grow up in. And what he does is he deals with life. There's nothing worse than having a man that's whining about everything. Wants to go home to mama. If you you know if he's that type of man, then uh, what you you know if you're dating him, don't you know call it off right away because it's going to get worse. And uh, the scripture I'm going to use is in Second Thessalonians three and three. It says that, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And that's what we need to do is to guard our children against the things of society, what you know the culture and the society is saying about you know the things that we should be you know raising them up. We gotta guard them against those things and keep them in the word of God. Also fathers should be one that you know stands by their children. You know, just is still and protected. As we found in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 6, it says that you know be strong and be of good courage. And then he says that you can take the lamb for the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And that's what a father should let a child know is that I'm still with you. You know, we know I may not be there uh, in bodily form, but I'm still with you. I'm still guard, you know, watching over you. And we find again in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, that the Lord also said that he is, Lo, I am with you always. And so that's what we need to be. The next thing that uh, fathers should be is providers. And when I'm talking about providers, I'm not talking about materialistic things. Even though that's very important, but it's not as important as uh, giving love and support to our children and to our family. Being supportive to our wives, being, being loving. Uh, children know if parents you know, really love each other. They really do. You know, you can try to fake it. You know, I've I had parents that said that they'll stay together because uh, for the good of the children. But you, you felt the tension all the time. We need to understand that we men were created in God's image. Right. Okay. And so we are to be providers. Where does this come from? Well, Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13. We know the story about uh, Abraham sacrificing. Isaac before the Lord and he was about ready to plunge the knife into him when the Lord told him to stop. I know now that you fear me. And he's, and then we find that the Lord provided a what? 
a sacrifice. Right. You know, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. And so we are to be providers. The next thing that we are to be is promoters. Fathers are to be promoters. You know, we do not nitpick at every little mistake our child makes. Or, you know, we are not to nitpick. We are not to allow negative thoughts, you know, to come out of our mouths, nor come out of the mouths of our children. You know, we always to, to believe in them, talk positive to them. We find that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, you know, the story of David. David was the shepherd. Uh, all the sons were prayed before Samuel, but not David. We find that the Lord promoted David. He says, I saw you in the field when you were still young. And so the Lord was a believer and he was a promoter for his children. The next thing that we are to be is priests. Every man should be the priest of his house. You are the priest. You're the spiritual leader. You're the guider. You find that Paul says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere. Right. Notice that he said, he said, the men to pray everywhere. It's really sad when you come to church and you find that the prayer room is full of women, but right. the men are not there. What are the men are also to do? They are to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So in other words, again, our children... And our spouses knows that if we're at home mumbling and grumbling and complaining about this and complaining about that, and then we come to church, you know, and we put on a different air, so we're going to worship and we're going to praise God, they know the difference. Yes, amen. The priesthood starts at home. And so we find that we are, to, as men, to teach our children how to build altars. Right. We find that Adam, even though it doesn't say in the Word of God, but... Abel and Cain learned from somebody how to build an altar. We find that no, the first thing that he did before everybody else came out of the ark, he built himself an altar. And so we are to build an altar. Men should be the prayer warriors. We are the prayer warriors. We find in James chapter seven or five, verse seventeen through eighteen, that Elijah was a man like us who prayed earnestly. Right. In fact, he was a man that, you know, the effectual prayer of a you know, righteous man avails much. And so we are to be prayer warriors. We find that a lot of times when women pray, they pray with their feelings. Right. Oh God, take care of him. Oh God, do this. You know, they pray with their feelings. But what do men do? Men usually say, you know, Lord, I need to talk to you about, you know, a uh, certain bill that I have and it you know, and we've got to pay this bill. We don't use, you know, our whole being in it when we're praying. We need to start praying for things that are more important. We need to pray for our nation. Yes. Right. Yes. We have a nation that does not understand that been raised without fathers. Yeah. And everything that's gone through, you know, the last little while is because of a child that's thrown a tantrum tantrum. Right. I saw a funny thing, you know, a uh, uh, cartoon character says that, you know, the child that threw the tension tantrum in Walmart is now growing up and throwing tension tantrums. Right. They don't know how to be men. This is where the father needs to be in the home and be the priest of the home, the prayer warrior. You know, mom is the supporter of the prayer warrior. The next thing that the last thing that I'm going to say is that the men should be the prophets of their home. Yes. We are the ones that should be speaking truth to each and every one of our children. You know, at first when Tipper said that she wanted to be a, uh, a veterinarian, I said, sure, we'll do that. You know, like, and I kept, you know, reiterating to her that, you know, yes, she can be this. But in the back of my mind, I had a little bit of doubt. I thought, when it gets a little messy, she won't want to be a, you know, a veterinarian. Well, when she went to school, what happened was that she, you know, she began to tell us all the different things that she did. I would have been grossed up, but she enjoyed it. You know, Bethany wanted to be 
one thing, and, and I supported her on that for a while, but then she decided to go into another area, and I told her, I said, you know, honey, you can be a school teacher instead. That would be better for you. Support her. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, that we are to train up the child in the way he should go. We should already see our children and know yes. what they're going to be before they grow up. Yes, and helping them in their careers. In their careers. Yes. Train them up in the ways they should go. And they will never part from it. Right. A lot of times, you know, sometimes parents put what they want their children to be. And that frustrates the child. Right. We are to examine them. We are to pray about it. And then allow the Lord to begin to help us to guide them in the ways that they should go. And they won't depart from it. Just like one time when one of my children asked, you know, said, Dad, you know, I don't understand why I have to do certain things. And the same people that go to church don't have to do the same thing. They believe the same things we did. And now all I said, I said, well, honey, it all depends. Who do you love the most? Do you love God more? Or do you love yourself? And she said, well, I love God. And I said, well, there you go. And see, the thing is, is that, and I never had a problem with, you know, that issue again. See, the thing is, is that we are to train them. We find that when uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 18, when Rachel gave birth to Benjamin, she called him the son of my sorrow. And Jacob heard about that when the nurse brought the baby to him and said, this is your new baby son, and his name is this, the son of my sorrow. And Jacob said, no, that's not what he's going to be called. He is going to be called Benjamin, the son of my strength. Right. And we find that the tribe of Benjamin, even though it was small, was the one that produced the first king. It was also the, uh, the tribe that stood with the, the uh, nation of Judah, they were most of them were left-handed, but they were great warriors. Hallelujah. Come on, church. So if we do these five things, hallelujah, then we will, you know, be successful in our fatherhood. Yes. Praise God. And that's all I got to say today. You know, I could elaborate it, but I'm going to just... Uh, can we just stand and thank the Lord for what He has done? Hallelujah. Praise God. I am so thankful for my Heavenly Father. I am thankful for a Father that taught me you know, things. When I was young, I just thought that my dad wasn't the smartest person. But I remember one day I sat down with him and we were talking and I asked him some questions. And it made a lot of sense to me. And I realized, you know, this man is not as dumb as I thought he was. But he was a very wise person. And I am thankful. He was a hard worker. He did provide. Praise the Lord. Can we walk in an example of the one that created us to be fathers? Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. Be fruitful and multiply to be a father. Hallelujah. Some people cannot have their own children. And I understand that. But we can be a father to somebody. I'm thankful for all those spiritual men in my church that were fathers to me. That's what Chad said. Joash. Praise God. We serve a wonderful Father. Yes, amen. A great teacher. And His name is Jesus. Can we worship Him right now? Hallelujah. We thank You, Lord. Bless You, Lord. Oh, bless You. 